Introducing our host, Fred Swanaker, in conversation with iconic global leaders. Welcome to The Pathway. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise and join me in welcoming our guest of honor, His Excellency Paul Kagame, the President of the Republic of Rwanda. Good afternoon and welcome, Your Excellency, President of the Republic of Rwanda, Dr. Fred Swanika, Dr. Sinait Fiseha, distinguished guests and fellow students. My name is Alice Lambert Rutaisire, a second year computer science student at the African Leadership University, and I am the MC for today. <clears throat> Without further ado, I now welcome the host, CEO, and founder of the African Leadership Group, Dr. Swanika. You may now take the floor. Thank you, Alice. Your Excellency, Paul Kagame, President of the Republic of Rwanda, members of the Cabinet of Rwanda, Dr. Sinait Fiseha, Director of Global Programs at the Susan Thompson Buffett Foundation, Mr. Faustin Mbundu, Chairman of the Board of ALU Rwanda, Rita Roy, President and CEO of the MasterCard Foundation, members of the room who are joining us uh, live from all over the world, um, and our viewers on Rwanda National Television and on YouTube, and the beautiful young people of Rwanda, and young Africans who are attending African Leadership University, who are all here in our live audience today. Good afternoon and welcome to the room. <clears throat> My name is Fred Swanika, and I'm the founder of the African Leadership Group, which includes the African Leadership Academy, the African Leadership University, and now The Room. Ladies and gentlemen, the rest of the world is aging. The average age of a German or Japanese is 48. Even in China, last year, the population declined. We are by far the youngest continent in the world. And anyone who knows me knows that I'm very passionate about the young people of Africa. I believe that our youth, our greatest treasure, more valuable than our oil, our gold, and our diamonds. And this is why I've dedicated my life to unlocking the potential of Africa's youth. And why we at the African Leadership Group have set out on a mission to educate three million leaders for Africa by 2035. So how does this thing called the room fit into that picture? Well, one of the things we've learned over the years in building the African Leadership Group is that it's not enough to educate young people. Once young people have education, they also need opportunities to apply that education, opportunities to make a living, opportunities to have an impact. For example, research shows that 75% of jobs are never advertised. They're hidden. They're filled by word of mouth. The same holds true for anyone who's looking for venture capital to start their, their, their small business, anyone who's looking for mentorship, looking for a fellowship. You simply cannot find these things out in the open. So if the vast majority of opportunities are hidden, then how can young people progress? The answer, we believe, lies in relationships. Simply put, young people need powerful relationships and networks 
with key people who can support them to find that first internship, to help them get their first job, who can mentor them, who can advise them, who can invest in their first startup, and people who can generally open doors for them. I can attest to this myself. Each and every opportunity that I have ever received is due to a relationship that I had with someone. Usually someone that was more powerful than I was, more established than I was. And that is why we created The Room. So The Room is bringing together those who on the one hand can provide the opportunities. And on the other hand, the young people who are looking for and who need those opportunities. And then we're matching them to each other. So in the room are very influential professionals at the top of their game in various fields. From Africa and from around the world, they are CEOs, they are venture capitalists, they are angel investors, they are corporations, they are foundations, they are philanthropists, and anyone who's looking to connect with top talent and to have an impact on the next generation. Those are the people that you find in the room. And our vision is that in major cities around the world, you'll be able to walk into a physical space called The Room. They won't, they won't all be as big as this one, <laughs> but you can imagine spaces in different cities around Africa called The Room. And when you go there, you'll find the next generation of dreamers, of game changers, and doers all in the same room. So I want all of the young people in the room to repeat after me. Go to the room. Okay. So if you're an employer and you're looking to hire software engineers or data scientists, what do you do? Go to the room. You're a film producer. You're looking for the best young actors in the city. What do you do? Go to the room. You're a bank. You're looking for young financial analysts. What do you do? Go to the room. You're a venture capitalist or an angel investor looking for young entrepreneurs to invest in. What do you do? Go to the room. You get it. So this isn't just the, for the benefit of young people. Room members themselves will benefit because they get to build amazing relationships with each other. They're influential, so they want to meet each other, right? They get to participate in exciting events and conversations like this one, The Pathway. And perhaps, most importantly, they benefit by having access to top young talent that they need to do their own work as leaders. Because young people, just as you need opportunities, successful leaders cannot do their work without your brilliant minds and energy. This is especially important as the world gets taken over by technology. See, I used to be called a young person. These days, I think I'm bordering on, on uh, you know, maturing. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and we older people, we don't know how to use technology. Some of you may have seen that I'm getting more active on Instagram these days. It's because my niece is teaching me how to do that stuff. And she's 21, right? 22, actually. You know, now I'm, I know how to hold a camera. Before, I didn't even know where to put, where to look when I'm using Instagram. So... We older people do not know how to use technology. And for businesses to survive, seasoned professionals and managers need your expertise. So everyone in the room benefits from these relationships that come together. And today we're joined by about 300 members of the room for, from around the world who are dialing in live into this conversation. And the Pathway is a conversation series where we invite iconic world leaders to share their experiences of doing hard things with our members. And typically, our featured guests also encourage our members to use their privilege to do hard things to impact the world and to create opportunities for others. So that's what the room is. Now, I hope you understand how it fits into what we're doing to create opportunities for millions of young people in Africa. And to kick us off today, it's my immense pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Rita Roy. Rita is the president and CEO of the MasterCard Foundation, one of the largest foundations in the world. And prior to the MasterCard Foundation, Rita was the divisional vice president of global citizenship and policy at Abbott, and she led Abbott's public-private initiatives related to HIV and AIDS in Africa. 
and also was involved in a lot of global health programs. Before Abbott, Rita held a number of leadership positions at Bristol Myers Squibb and also worked at the United Nations. She holds seven honorary doctorate degrees from various universities in Africa, Latin America, the Middle East, and Canada. And she's a fierce advocate for the young people of Africa. As the president of the MasterCard Foundation, she has dedicated the tremendous assets of the foundation to a single purpose, to create work opportunities for 30 million young people in Africa by 2030. So the MasterCard Foundation is investing billions of dollars into young people in Africa to make this mission happen. And we're proud to partner with them in their mission. So in fact, African Leadership Academy, African Leadership University, and the room would not exist without the fabulous support of the MasterCard Foundation. Rita is a dear friend and was actually one of the first guests who I had on the pathway when we, when we launched the, season, the series last year. So without further ado, um, Rita Roy um, would have loved to join us in person. Um, she has personally moved here to um, Kigali and has moved several of her executives of the foundation to live here, which is a true demonstration of partnership by proximity. And it's something that I hope other foundations that are doing work in Africa will also follow in their lead. And uh, unfortunately, she wasn't able to join us here in person, but she has recorded a short video message for you. Your Excellency, President Kagame, Fred Swanica, founder of the ALG Group, young people, it is such a thrill for me to be with all of you today and to join you virtually. This is a wonderful platform, and it is so good to see it serving the needs of young leaders across Africa. Let me introduce myself. My name is Rita Roy, and I'm the president and CEO of the MasterCard Foundation. Our foundation's vision is a world in which all people, all people, have an opportunity to learn and prosper. We began working in Africa well over a decade ago, and we came here drawn by the energy and aspirations of young people. That's why we are investing in young people. Your dreams, your choices matter. They will change this continent, and not just this continent, they will change the world. We have set out a bold goal to enable 30 million young people across Africa, particularly young women, to access dignified and fulfilling work by 2030. And we launched this strategy, which we call Young Africa Works, right here in Rwanda. So we are very appreciative of the wise counsel and leadership of President Kagame. He embodies so much of what it takes to lead, vision, courage, resilience, discipline. But like all of us, the president is also the sum of his experiences. He has a story. Today, we get to hear that story. And in doing so, we get to be reminded that leaders aren't just born, they're made. They're made through circumstances, difficult situations that they didn't choose. But leaders also are made through choices they make. Big choices, small choices, that call upon their grit and their determination to do the right thing even when the right thing is the hard thing. We also know leaders are made through the influence of others, people who have mentored, challenged, and inspired us, and keep us grounded. So no matter who you are, no matter how challenging life is, no matter if people understand you, find your moral purpose. Learn from others. It's such an honor to learn from President Kagame today and I hope that our conversation here sparks a chain of transformative actions in your lives. And this enables you to do the hard things because that's what our continent needs and that's what our world needs. Thank you. Thank you, Rita, for those inspiring remarks and for your powerful reminder of the importance of doing hard things. Our second speaker, Dr. Sanait Fiseha, is a globally recognized leader in reproductive health and rights and is a lifelong gender champion. She currently serves 
as the Director of Global Programs as a, at the Susan Thompson Buffett Foundation, as well as the Chief Advisor to the Director General of the World Health Organization. So she has been really involved in this fight against the, uh, COVID during this pandemic. And prior to her work at the Susan Buffett Foundation, Professor Fiseha was the Chief of Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility at the University of Michigan's and founding director of the Center for Especially, it's young women and girls. I first met her when she visited the African Leadership Academy with former President uh, Barack, former U.S. President Barack Obama, and we've been friends of her and collaborators ever since then. In fact, we're working together now to develop more young women leaders for the continent. She is someone who does hard things, and looks like a lot of people who do hard things are moving to Rwanda. So she has also moved to Rwanda, and we thought that she could uh, share some words with us before we start the discussion with His Excellency President Kagame. Thank you, Fred, for that kind introduction. Your Excellency, uh, President Kagame, President of the Republic of Rwanda, ladies and gentlemen, and most importantly, the young men and women who are in this room, as well as tuning in from around the country and the world. Muraho. I want to thank the Office of the President, as well as Fred Swanaker and the room, or Pathway, for inviting me to participate and give my reflections in this fantastic event. I'm personally moved because this is, I think, the first largest event we've had in this convention center, signaling that we are trying to get back to the old normal, although it will never be the same. It's truly an honor uh, to speak with the next generation of change makers, particularly in a year when strong commitment and leadership is more important and more urgent. We can't just turn into our elected officials. Seeing all of you in this room reminds me of my own journey that started in this beautiful continent. I was born and raised in Ethiopia. I was raised by parents who prioritized education and also allowed me to follow and pursue my dreams. I left for the U.S. right after high school and studied, as uh, Fred talked about, law and medicine because I was very interested in human rights and health as a human right. That ability, that education, and that autonomy over my body and my future absolutely shaped the path for my life. And, as Fred mentioned, had propelled me to be impactful playing some leadership roles in various platforms around the world. But what good does a privilege, power, or platforms do that we earn, that we fought for, unless we're using them to lift each other up? The COVID-19 pandemic made that very, very clear to me, and it was in the middle of that pandemic that I decided to pack and uproot my family and move to Kigali, this beautiful and special place that I now proudly call home. So I tell everyone I'm an Ethiopian by birth and Rwandan by choice. 
So when I talk to you, I'm not reaching out to you wearing my foundation hat or my professor hat or my global leader. I'm really talking to you as a fellow Rwandan. We've all seen COVID-19 continues to create havoc. We've seen it is overwhelming systems around the world. As we speak globally, 219 million have con people have contracted the virus and over close to 4.6 million people have perished. But we have seen, again, around the world, it is not the amount of resources you have or whether you are called a developed nation or a developing nation, but rather it's really good leadership that has emerged as one of the key factors that unifies countries that have performed really well in managing the COVID pandemic. And I'm really proud that Rwanda, our country, is one of those. But that just didn't happen, right? That requires leadership. And I'm deeply inspired by the leadership of President Kagame and the government of Rwanda and the citizens of Rwanda, frontline providers that each and every day have sacrificed so much so that we keep our society as a whole safer. Rwanda is a leader in so many ways. An example of innovation, determination, and resilience. Its recovery since the Rwandan genocide against the Tutsi, a nightmare that few outside of the country can even imagine, has been nothing short of incredible. Having learned that priceless value and worth of a human life, the policy to protect and save lives during COVID-19 pandemic has come at a significant economic cost for the people in the country. But on the balance, Rwandans are better for it. I think that Rwanda understands better than many in the country the most valuable and important resource are its people especially its young people. They say every storm has a silver lining. The paradoxical effect of COVID on Rwanda's future, your future as Rwandan youth, is how Rwanda as a country with disciplined leadership at the government level and exemplary citizenship of the population has negotiated this pandemic and it's positioned us for accelerated growth in the immediate future. Your generation's future and responsibility. We have a long road ahead of us, but we are emerging out of it. The social and economic future of this nation is extraordinary as this COVID experience has shown us discipline, stability, security, but more predictable governance, which is really truly lacking around the world, an ideal env env environment for investment and economic and academic opportunities is what we have in our hands here. Rwanda is a world leader in closing the gender gap. As you know, our parliament is about 64% women. But that also has to translate into livelihoods. Investing in cross-cutting issues of health, economics, education, and equality for girls and women creates a ripple effect of positive outcomes throughout society. So I want to take this opportunity, much like Rwanda has done, I want to challenge the room, the pathway, and all members of the room that are virtually logged in to really invest and make a commitment to leveling the, leveling the uh, playing field for women and girls that are the next generation of leaders. You are, all of you, women and men, are a critical growing network of young leaders around the world ready to take on our biggest challenges. 
And you're supported amazingly in this country by leaders across the country who believe in your vision and power. Transforming systems, achieving justice, taking your seat at the table and making impact, this will mean getting comfortable, making yourself and other people uncomfortable, and fighting relentlessly, relentlessly to do what is right. Do not lose hope. This is undoubtedly a very difficult time for all of us. There are lots of uncertainties, fear, discomfort, and at times you second guess yourself. But in the face of that, remember there is incredible opportunity for you to be a positive force to change and shape Rwanda's future in a very impactful way. We all applaud, not just us in this room, but the world, President Kagame's leadership and what he has done in his tenure to position this country in the world. That responsibility is going to be shouldered on you. So when you are in this room, you are the chosen one. You have the opportunity. So many young people around this continent will do anything to say it was their to sit with their leaders, which is a common thing I see in Rwanda. Don't take it for granted. Your unique voice and point of view matters. Own your vision and your leadership. Let that energize you and inspire you. Focus not on what you don't have, but rather on the power you have to change what is around you and strive to embody these values of rigor, determination, solidarity, and love every single day. Thank you so much. Morocco Zaychani. Thank you, Dr. Sanait, for those inspiring words. And now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the moment that we have all been waiting for. Um, we have a chance to now sit down and uh, all of you will ha have a chance to um, engage with uh, one of our greatest leaders of our current time, um, a, a, a man who has led tremendous growth uh, in this country and is an advocate for gender equality, environmental conservation, uh, innovation and prosperity on this continent. Uh, His Excellency, Paul Kagame, President of the Republic of Rwanda. Please join me on stage. <laughs> President Kagame, uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, making the time to have this conversation with us today. Um, I know all the young people in the audience and uh, our viewers on YouTube and, and, and members of the room who are joining us uh, from around the world. Some people are in the U.S. at 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. and are very excited to, to be in this conversation with you. Um, you know, when um, I asked you uh, to have this conversation, uh, you graciously agreed, but uh, on one condition. You said that you, would have, you wanted me to come to Rwanda and to have this conversation with a group of young people. Uh, and throughout um, the years that I've known you, President Kagame, I've always seen how much you, you believe in young people. You know, you've, whether it's uh, investing in education or um, you know, many of your own uh, ministers in the cabinet have, have always been surprised at how young they are, the people who work in your personal office. Um, you know, very young people um, who are guiding you and working with you on a day-to-day -day basis, yourself personally as a leader, um, and even, you know, investing in things like the Kigali Sports Arena um, to, to, to ensure that young people have access to sports. I remember attending a, a concert there uh, once. Um, I can't remember if it was Neo um, or uh, Pato Ranking from Nigeria, and uh, there was a big... Uh, you know, thousands of young people who had gathered. And, uh, but at some point, I couldn't tell who 
the, 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 the star was because you came into the room and you went down to the floor and everyone um, started, you know, cheering. <laughs> but it's very clear as well that young people really uh, also enjoy the interactions with you. So um, I just really wanted to start with uh, understanding why young people matter so much to you. Um, you know, why do the young people of Rwanda especially matter so much to you? And then also when you think about the African continent more broadly, uh, what do you see as the potential of young people and also the challenges of young people in Africa? Good. Thank you, Fred. Um, uh, that time we met, uh, not only was I enjoying the company of the young people, but also enjoying the music <laughs> and the dancing. So, to your question. We all, when we are lucky and happy to be living uh, and we many times live uh, in the moment we, we make sense of uh, that moment but at the same time there is more sense to be made based on that moment for the future it's the moment it's more so the future and when you're talking about the future, you're talking about those who are going to be in that future or to actually build the future or live those moments of the future. And you are necessarily talking about the young people of now. And that also means the life of a country, the country in the future is to be shaped by the very young people of today. So if their thinking goes like that, then that is the sense it makes to be thinking about the young people today, but more so thinking of them for the sake of the future. So that, that's, that's my thinking. I, I guess it's uh, the thinking of many people uh, who see the value of the young people and they need to invest in them and uh, they know they're investing in the future when they're investing in the young people. And just a follow-on question to that, uh, Mr. President. Why do you think that um you know, uh, when you be go beyond Rwanda and you look at the whole continent, uh, the average age of, the, of, um, of an African, as I mentioned, is 19. Um, and do you believe that, the, you know, your fellow leaders on the continent and, and, and the, yeah, the you know, whether it's leaders in business, <laughs> leaders in government, um, what more should we be doing to really open up opportunities for the young people of Africa? Well, every leader, I guess, they do things differently, uh, but uh, for every leader or leaders of a country, there are many different levels. Um, there are things you want to build uh, that form uh, a foundation. Uh, a foundation on which generations uh, will take turns uh, building uh, different things for, for themselves, for the country, for the population. So in Rwanda, that's where I'm, uh, I mean, I'm used to things we do here, I'm a participant, I'm a, uh, so I, we try to concentrate on investing in our young people in technology on which they can build and help them move forward, the infrastructure, the institutions that uh, hold the population together. And so this, if you take just that as an example, I imagine that's what different 
societies, different countries try to do as well. And maybe sometimes we do things differently, people succeed and others not as well as the others have succeeded. Uh, and that is due to many reasons, so depending on the conditions in which different people operate. But I always hope that again, as we started earlier, uh, people's responsibilities don't get lost just in the moment. And uh, they concentrate on that and stop thinking about the future. Uh, so leaders, therefore, what I know we are all supposed to be thinking about is about what we have, what we see, what we hear in the moment, but take it and project it uh, so many years ahead. And you really can't do that without investing, as we have repeatedly said, uh, in the young people and providing these opportunities we understand that shape them and therefore they also help shape the future. So for you, it's really about that long-term view, recognizing that young people are the future. And if you want to build a society that is stable and prosperous and that actually um, you know, thrives in the long term, then you have to invest in, in, in young people. There's no doubt about that. Okay. Now, um, Your Excellency, here in the room, uh, we talk a lot about doing hard things. And we challenge the members of the room, who are very influential, very successful, to you know, use their privilege to do hard things because we believe that uh, the only way they can justify their privilege is by uh, not solving uh, small problems and easy things, but by doing hard things and uh, to really change society and to create opportunities for others, like the young people that are in the room today. Now, you've done some incredibly hard things. You've transformed uh, Rwanda into a, a fast-growing economy after uh, you know a devastating ge genocide, um, and um, Today, you, you've also led the reform of uh, one of the most difficult institutions to reform, which is the African Union. Um, and, uh, you know, Rwanda is now one of the first countries um, on this continent that is going to be manufacturing its own vaccines. In fact, last week, uh, Tuesday, I interviewed on this very show uh, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo-Wela from the um, World, Health, World Trade Organization, and she was, you know, uh, very passionate and, and complimentary about the work that you were doing to uh, manufacture vaccines in Rwanda. Um, so these are some of the most difficult things that one could, uh, could choose to do. Uh, and yet you, you continue to, do, to choose to do hard things. Um, why do you do this time and time again? Do you, do, you, do you choose to do some of these very difficult things? Well, to begin with, uh, those hard things must be done. So somebody has got to do the hard things. Uh, why I would uh, look at myself as uh, one not to be among those doing the hard things, I, I wouldn't have a good reason, so I, I do that. But I also want to say it's not just doing hard things. Uh, in fact, it starts with doing even simple things. Sometimes uh, people take things to be so simple that they don't pay attention to them. Yet, cumulatively, they really add up to situations that will require you to do the hard things. So you can make the work of doing hard things much easier by paying attention to the simple, smaller things in time uh, so that the whole movement, I, I liked the way you called things here, the, the pathway. The pathway can be very difficult or can be simple depending on how you paid attention to the simple, the easy, but also the hard things. So it's not just um, 
going for the hard things necessarily, but the hard things also have their, that, their, their time, uh, especially the, the, like the example you, you just uh, given. Um, we reach there and when we look back at, at the moment of doing the hard things, you look back and say, well, we've lost time. If we had done a few things properly, the right way, 10 years ago, maybe these hard th things would not be there today for us to you know, immerse ourselves and start doing them. They would be simpler because we would have laid the foundation, we would have put the infrastructure in place uh, to deliver on them. Uh, sometimes they become hard things just because they, they were not uh, paid attention to in, in good time. So what you're saying is that on the journey to doing hard things, um, the destination might be um, a very uh, difficult thing to imagine. Um, getting to that top of that to that mountain, but uh, sometimes doing hard things uh, requires doing simple things in the beginning, and, and it's accumulation of all those simple things. Like the Chinese say, a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Absolutely. Taking those small steps. Can you give us an example of a simple thing that others may have taken for granted, but that you thought was important and that you saw as a key ingredient or, or, or as, a, as a step towards achieving a much, much more difficult thing? Well, let me give you an example of a city of Kigali, where it was uh, 20 years ago and where it is now, a uh, completely different world. So when you look at uh, the city now, the infrastructure, the cleanliness, the traffic lights, you know, everything almost uh, in place, you would say doing this thing was very hard, right? But the journey started uh, 20 years ago. And starting with what you can do, just do it right. Uh, I remember having a discussion with uh, fellow cabinet members when this whole thing about uh, keeping our environment clean and sustainable. And the beginning of the conversation was do we need donors to give us money to keep our homesteads clean to even ourselves as tidy and safe and healthy as we can there are things we can do. We don't have to wait for somebody to come and hand us uh, to us the means to do that because we have the means in our, within ourselves. So I said, why don't we do what we can at this moment? Why don't we just, uh, you know, pick the litter and put uh, that in the right place where they belong in. And then with the time as the economy grows and does fine, as we, the revenues grow and so on, then we, and of course as donors, you know, donate to us what they can and usually do, then we shall, from these means acquired start investing in the things we weren't able to do because we had no means for that. So the simple things, therefore, that looks simple. I, 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 
just, I mean, for a, a light moment, I will say, sometimes when, when that exercise started, I would be driving in the city. When I saw the litter around, uh, plastic bags, paper thrown all over, I would literally, well, stop my car, convoy, and that tended to also stop the traffic. <laughs> but the purpose would be I would get out with my escort guards who are paid to do different things and say, let's, uh, let's, uh, you know, we would pick that litter. Would say, why, why would I pass and leave the, the litter? The whole president of a country picking up litter. Uh-huh, exactly. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> But that has an effect. One, even starting with the, my entourage, they started thinking, well, we shouldn't leave this whole thing here. First of all, why do people go throwing litter around? And at uh, the same time, the traffic that has come to a halt because I think they would even start saying, what is this man up to? What's wrong with him? When they see me do that, they start thinking about it. I say, why would, why would, as you said, why would the president stop and do this? Uh, and then next you say, maybe I should also not just uh, <laughs> <laughs> pass by this and do that. So these are simple things. You don't need to pay a lot of money. You don't need to be paid a lot of money to, to do that, to just... Uh, this is a simple thing. But that in combination now with the investments that are to be made ahead now for the hard things to happen, you see one thing leads to another, but they also are complementary. If you waited to go for the big thing and the hard thing, and then you leave these small things here and there without paying attention to them. Then you, you probably miss the point and in the end you don't uh, arrive at the good results you want. Mm. So you're, you've touched on a few things. You're talking about the importance of leading by example. You know, you getting out of the car yourself and picking up the litter. You're talking about self-reliance as well. Mm -hmm. You know, not waiting for donors to uh, give you the funding so you can clean up the streets. Get going. And and, uh, and then that, uh, you know, also, you, you talked about, you know, you also touched on the import, what, what that does to the psyche, and then also uh, in terms of the work ethic that it creates and the standards that you set, to say that it's important enough to keep our streets clean. And therefore, this sets a high aspiration for the country, and then, you, you know, people then want to do more. And it is important enough for the president to get out of the car and pick... Uh, <laughs> So if he can do it, you have no excuse to not do it yourself. <laughs> Excellent. Um, now, Mr. President, you make a lot of unconventional decisions. For example, Rwanda was the first uh, country, I think, in the world to allow you know, blood delivery by drone uh, with, with Zipline. Um, you know, in the early stages, uh, when you went after the genocide, when you were thinking about uh, rebuilding the economy, you prioritized sectors that others would have thought you know, this is not the most important. You, you decide to invest in the environment and you prioritize, you know, uh, conservation, tourism around the gorillas as one of the key first things to do to, to really rebuild the, the economy. Um, you built a national airline um, and created this world-class convention center at a time when most people couldn't imagine Rwanda as where they would go for, you know, their, their conferences. Uh, and finally today, Rwanda is the first African country to brand two football teams, uh, Arsenal and Paris Saint-Germain. Um, again, people wouldn't think, you know, why is an African country investing in branding uh, European football teams? So when you make these decisions, um, I can imagine that they might not be popular, um, either in Rwanda and even around the world. Uh, what gives you the courage to make these decisions when others don't believe in what you're proposing, and how do you bring people along to achieve these great things? Well, that is the um, most difficult 
question perhaps, but also experience. Um, and in most cases, you know, there are things you are, that have been talked about. You give, let's say, to young people, you give them an education, you give them advice, you, you know, you do all, so, all sorts of things. But at the end of the day, there are things only these people, these young people can give to themselves. You may give them everything you can give them. Uh, but there is that thinking in them. They have to undertake to say, what sense do I make with all this that I have acquired? I have acquired education, I'm healthy, I'm, you know, I've been advised, you know, to be a leader. You, you, you don't become a leader or you don't develop a vision by just going to school. No. Somehow you build on what you have acquired and then there is something that only you can give to yourself. And that is, what do you do with what you have? So let me, let me go to, to the bigger question you raised. For example, when we arrived here in 94, almost, I mean, the population, half of the population, a big part of it dead, a bigger part of it displaced, others in the old problems they had anyway, because this was, was, uh, has been a poor country and feeding on what is given to us and so on and so forth. That is the story. So when we took over in 94, with all this devastation, you are challenged to say, where do I start from? What do I do? You have no means, you have no people, even the people you have, everyone is just uh, grieving and doesn't know where to start from. And everyone is, in the end, that's how actually people start blaming each other for they are misery. It's like you think when you are having a problem with somebody else who caused it. Uh, and everybody thinks like that and it goes around to the point that... Uh, so, but in a situation like that, you have to do some hard thinking. You talked about doing hard things. The hard thinking is, what do I do? How do I move on? Where do I start from? So you are challenged to think beyond what we are used to, because you might have, uh, you know, a textbook that tells you, you know, to, to build an economy, to do this, da, da, da. you follow this path, you do this, you do that. It doesn't work at that, in that time. It's not in the textbook? <laughs> it just doesn't. <laughs> textbook is uh, probably, 10%. <laughs> the rest is that hard thinking. And thinking out of the box. You no longer have to say, you know, to achieve this. For example, we also had another big problem. Um, we had cases in the hundreds of thousands of people who have killed their fellow Rwandans. Forget about whether anybody had justification or that. No, let's put even that aside. You already have people. And in that situation, you're going to necessarily have those who have lost and are aggrieved, those, the perpetrators, and then there is trying to settle it the way they can. If somebody lost a family 
and is thinking the other one is the one responsible, they will tend, they will not wait for the textbook justice. They want to go for that one and actually sort it out for themselves and say, you killed my brother, you kill yours, or you killed my father, you kill yours, and so on and so forth. And on that scale, the things were here, there was no rational thinking to an extent. Everyone was just affected by what they have seen, what they have experienced, what has happened to them, and so on and so forth. To the extent you look around for the textbook that can give you a pathway from that point to move on, you won't find it. Therefore, it is that I was talking about. It is that that is in everyone that they can look up to and say, what do I do in this moment? Uh, I, my personal experience, uh, people made contributions with the different experiences and it all came together to give us what we, have, we were later to achieve. But mine was, first, for example, I was uh, leading uh, an army that fought and, and secured the country in the end. But those fighters I was with, many of them had lost uh, their parents, their relatives, that they, have, they were left alone. And you imagine this person has been fighting for something to liberate their country and finds nothing about in their, you know, their family, stopping that person to take it upon themselves to deal with the matter the way they understand it is difficult. It has to be outside of the textbook or the conventional thinking. But we had to do that. We had to say, look, what we have done is much bigger than ourselves. We have secured our country. It's true and it makes sense it, the way you, you, you are aggrieved, it's justified, and even what actions you can carry out may be actually justified in that sense. But if we allowed ourselves to be carried away and do that, which we think and which might be justified, what is going to be the end? It's just going to create a cycle of violence that will actually even consume the lives of those who are still living, all of us. So we've got to create a starting point, and the starting point is let's try and uh, live with our pain and manage it and, and then create space for a movement forward uh, create stability, create a sense of security, and uh, start building what we can build in terms of institutions, and then we can look back and start delivering what we are not able to deliver at the beginning. Uh, you know what developed, uh, like in terms of justice, Gachacha, and so on. Gachacha was just soul searching. See, because you knew if you had to take hundreds of thousands of cases to court. Which courts? First of all, the courts weren't there. Even if they were there, anywhere, wherever they have uh, working courts and big, a lot of capacity, even if you said, please come and uh, help me try these cases, they would not manage. It would take hundreds of years to do that. But we can't wait for hundreds of years to live our lives of the moment. So we had to f keep finding ways out of the 
conventional methods that we know that we so that, that's really how we so we were more or less um, other than even the fact that originally we set out to liberate our country therefore we had a mission we understood very well and we knew it had a lot of problems but not as difficult or as many problems as we later on uh, came to meet. Uh, so using that background and at the same time challenging ourselves uh, to how we can deal with new situations that uh, we cannot find examples of anywhere to address and that we ourselves were the ones to deal with that. So that challenge that was, you know, we were really pressure cooked. It's like, we were, you know, we had to find a way of surviving that. And that delivered in many ways for us, but it had to take uh, some rational thinking uh, to get out of that and apply different means that uh, people may not be used to, whether ourselves or others who saw it from outside. Uh, but managed to come out like that. So I, I cannot say there is any magic that was really applied. It's, it's uh, uh, what is possible with the people. We did what is possible. If, uh, we, as human beings, uh, uh, I mean, our, our, our story tells uh, two parts, really. One part about human beings is uh, how destructive, even self-destructive we can be. But on the other side, uh, part of our story, which is the uh, one we are living today and interesting, is also how human beings can reach within themselves to do the very things that in the end may look like uh, a miracle. So the, it's all human beings. It's all, what, it's all within us, and that depends on, uh, this way I'm saying, you probably don't go to school anywhere for it, but, but we have it within us. Mm. And, and where we go to school and the education we get, of course, can be helpful. It informs you more, better, and, but there is that part that only we and others can do for themselves. Mm. So you... you... <laughs> Again, coming back to that point about self-reliance, and uh, there's certain things that you know you, you really can't be taught how to do. So you touched on two things that I thought important. One is the importance of um, uh, really uh, learning by doing, right? Because and one of the things that we um, <clears throat> you know share with our young leaders at African Leadership Academy and African Leadership University that to effectively develop yourself as a leader only 10% of the skills can be learned in the classroom. 20% comes from developmental relationships with your mentors and peers and coaches. And 70% comes from experience. You learn by doing. You have to try things and fail and, 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 and keep going. So you, you know, as much as, as important as it is to get education, um, you're not gonna be able to solve. You need, perhaps more important is to learn how to become a problem solver. And then with, that problem, with those problem-solving skills, when you meet new problems that you haven't identified before in the textbook, you can then solve them. And that's one of the things we really try and you know, uh, embed in our students, is to, to enable them to become problem-solvers, not simply people who have memorized facts and figures. The other thing <clears throat> that you talked about was uh, something that I always personally believe in is about how constraints drives innovation. And you were faced with a lot of constraints. As you mentioned, it would have taken a century to take people through the normal court system when, you know, after the genocide. So you had to think about a different way. You know, you didn't have many resources to develop the country, so you had to think a different way. And so, in theory, Africa, therefore, should be the most innovative continent in the world because we have a lot of constraints. And it forces you to reimagine and to rethink. You can't do things a conventional way when you have all these constraints. You have to reimagine and, and, and reinvent. Absolutely. And that's what you've done. Yeah, absolutely. So um, my last question before we, we, we take a break. So in other words, just a small thing before we leave that, to add to what you've said. 
the young people here, one thing you can learn as a person. First, before you go to another for help, make sure you have challenged yourself enough as to how much you can do for yourself, for yourself. Then, after that, you can reach out to a friend and say, but if you do it the other way around, it doesn't work well. If every time a problem, Fred, help me, uh, that's a, a big problem. <laughs> <laughs> but I will definitely come. <laughs> But I will definitely come to Fred when I have really tried and, you know, and convinced myself that probably I need help. Then it's right. It's okay to go for help. Mm -hmm. yes. People help those who help themselves. Oh, yes. Yeah. So get started. I hope you're, you're listening, young people in the room. Um, so my last question before we go for a break. Um, you know, here in the room, uh, we're an African organization, um, but we have... Uh, global uh, plans um, and the reason we're building a global network is because we believe that it's important for these African talent that we're developing to, to access global capital when they start their businesses and uh, to be able to access global markets you know if they're trying to export and so forth uh, and also one thing that COVID has made possible is that now it's possible to work globally without the brain drain you can be sitting in in Rwanda as a software engineer working for Siemens in Germany. You can be a designer in Nigeria working for Zara in Spain. And today, COVID has actually made companies a lot more open to hiring talent around the world. So we thought that we need to build a global platform and let the world know that we have top talent in that platform. And that allows us to export African talent but without the brain drain and to really create opportunities for young people on the global scale. Now, I've seen you engage um, a lot on the global stage as well. You know, um, I remember in 2019, when we still used to travel, uh, I went to San Francisco, and I went to the headquarters of Facebook. And they said, oh, President Kagame was here last week. And then I flew to New York, and uh, I met up with uh, uh, a friend and, a, and a, an investor, uh, Matt Harris. I think you know him. Um, and he said, oh, I just hosted President Kagame for dinner. Um, and, you know, we've met several times at the Milken Summit in, uh, in Los Angeles and so forth. So, um, you clearly engage globally, but yet you're proudly African. So, why is it so important for you to engage on the global stage and how have you leveraged those global relationships to uh, drive Rwanda's progress and development? By the way, let me, I, I should have done that Earlier, I have done it before anyway. Let me thank you for, I mean, Fred, thank you for being the idea behind this uh, African uh, Leadership University. It's really Pan-African. And, and the, and it also, gives us pride to be one of the hosts of, of uh, the and thank you for African Leadership University. Um, so, you see, there is a lot of work to do here in Africa, but it's always uh, going to serve us well if we move uh, not only in the right direction, but move properly in the right manner. The right manner, I mean, is there are things we need to address here in Africa, ourselves. We have the talent, the, the, the young people, the numbers speak for themselves. In comparison, you say Italia with the rest of the world. So we have to be organized. We need to get organized. How do we, therefore, if we, if we have the talent, if we have the young people, such a huge population, 
how do we get them organized in order to for them gain from the opportunities available and, and develop but also maximize on that talent pool and how we can tap into it ourselves for the African benefit. But then from there, you know, now it's not just uh, start with Africa and end with Africa. Africa is part of the world. There are things other parts of the world have that we need, either because we don't have them, or not even, uh, or because we need them to develop ourselves uh, to the levels where others are. So, therefore, how we get linked to the rest of the world is important. And that's how what you referred to has been happening. Not only am I trying to contribute to having the Rwandan talent pool, the African talent pool develop, develop with what we have, what we can put in place at that moment or what is available to us. But immediately I have to think about how do we connect this to the outside world because we need the outside world for different things that are very vital to our own progress. And that's how exactly uh, what you said has been happening. It's talent, uh, other talents that exist, that you connect with, it's capital that we need, that we have to link up with, it's technology that we need. And so that there is that link between Africa, Rwanda, and the rest of the world, and then uh, that will speed up our own progress. But that's really what uh, I have in mind. Now going to go to an interactive session with His Excellency the President. Um, and we're gonna start first with a couple of questions from our live audience um, <clears throat> who are joining us from different parts of Africa. Uh, the first person who's going to ask us a question uh, is, is joining us from Ghana. Um, her name is uh, Mrs. Margaret Nkrumah. And, uh, uh, She's the former CEO of um, SOS International uh, Organization, and she also started SOS International School. Can we have the question, please? Mr. President, naturally, you have a great deal of negative press from certain Western countries, despite visible and tangible evidence of your achievements. How do you deal with these accusations and vilifications, both publicly and internally? Thank you very much. Thank you. I think that's a very, uh, very uh, good question. There is only so much that one can do, uh, and you, uh, at least from my perspective, you always try to do what you can do, uh, and do the right thing and do it uh, the right way. So the negative press uh, from especially the Western world uh, it, it, it's not new, it has been there in the last, uh, for the last 20 
seven years really since 94, I remember. Uh, uh, so <sighs> there is not much I can do about it or any of us can do about it here in Rwanda because um, yes, it is from the other end. That's how they see things. Whether correctly or not, that's how they, or maybe that's how they want to see things. There's, there's how you see things, but there's also how you want to see things. Uh, I, I think in this case, maybe it is both. But so from the other side, ourselves, I, 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 there is no way I can change easily how someone wants to see me or sees me from their own uh, perspective. Uh, sometimes they must be looking at us through the lenses of their own, where, where they come from where things really might be different uh, from our own. Um, so the, the, there are ways maybe one can, the first thing that, that comes to my mind, what, what needs, uh, what we can do in Rwanda is take stock of what the press is saying. And try to analyze it and say, well, is this thing right about us? Or maybe it's wrong. Or, or does it have a basis? Or maybe you, you may learn something and it may help you to correct something you, you can correct. Uh, if you really discover, maybe they, they make sense. So that's where we, we concentrate. First, what we do in Rwanda and what we've tried to do for so many years now is, is really our business. <laughs> we think what we do is our business <laughs> before it becomes somebody's business. And we do it for ourselves and we try to do it the best way we can because we are the ones who benefit from it or lose from that if we do wrong things. Uh, so that interaction between what perception is about you from outside and what you think is right for you to do for yourselves, really I think may help lead even to getting things better. But the concentration should be more on doing what you think is the right thing for you. So that's why we concentrate. We concentrate on saying whatever angle they attack from, uh, and criticize and insult and do th things and misrepresent us and we still want to look at, could there be something maybe we need to pay attention to and bring it back to what we all along have been trying to do for ourselves and then see if it can improve us on, on many things or one thing or another and then we, we, we move along. Uh, that, that's the only option we have really to deal with that. Otherwise, it will take a very long time for me to uh, go into details of what I think about that. So I, I just maybe confine myself to these few important uh, remarks I, I've made. But we also know we have to deal with the world that, and here this is Africa, this is Rwanda, this is, there is, uh, from the outside, 
the Western media and others, well, even sometimes the politicians from there, they really think they are entitled to present us as they want us to be, not as we want ourselves to be. So they always make that judgment of saying, what is he doing? But what is he doing? What is he doing about this, about that? About... Is from how they would do them in their own place. Or sometimes, in fact, not consistent. Sometimes they may criticize you for doing what they do just because they think you are actually not entitled to doing that. You can't do that. That's not for you. It's for us. So <laughs> there is this back and forth that goes on forever. So in order not to be distracted and keep answering yourself on everything or being dragged to think like other people think and not think for yourselves about what we should be thinking and doing, you just concentrate on understanding what your problem is and trying to do the best you can to, to address it whether they are small things or the hard things, holistically. But keep, keep hearing, listening, and, and learning. And learning may be one thing or two, and it doesn't matter to, you know, it doesn't matter. It won't do any harm for people to listen and say, oh, does this really merit criticism? Does it? Uh, Maybe it does, and if you find it does, then you, you, you address it, but always keeping in focus uh, what is for you. Because we are not supposed to be people just answering to others all the time, <laughs> or, or, you know, framing our lives and our thinking just along the lines set by others. No, that's, uh, that's not for me, that's not for Rwandans, I think that's... Uh... So you're saying um, you don't ignore the criticism, you listen to it, you see what's merit, what, what, what is valid and what you might learn from it and how you might improve some things, um, but then you're also very capable of you know, separating that from criticism that maybe you don't feel as unjustified and you also have your own standards and your own, um, you know, and one of the things that I love as well is very often you, the spirit of Agachiro that you talk about here in Rwanda, you know, that, you know, um, believing in ourselves and, 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 and self-sustenance and I think that's a, a wonderful spirit that others in Africa can also borrow. Um, Okay, okay, our next question um, comes from uh, another member of the room, uh, and his name is Ken Njoroge. Uh, he's joining us from Nairobi, Kenya. Good afternoon, Mr. President. My name is Ken Njoroge. I'm an entrepreneur based in Nairobi, Kenya. Over the last 18 years, I co-founded and built a fintech company uh, that expanded across, across Africa. We have 18 uh, offices across Africa serving 35 countries. Uh, we employ about uh, 450 people, about 90% of them are young people between 25 and 30. Uh, we've been a proud uh, member of the room and a good partner to the AL group. Uh, we sponsored uh, six uh, students throughout the university program. Uh, recently, we took another six in a graduate management program. The plan is to um, hire about six uh, to ten ALU students from the different campuses, Mauritius and the campus in Kigali. Uh, I have been a fan and a big follower of your leadership journey uh, over the last three decades from the early days of the liberation struggle uh, to the current uh, social and economic transformation of Rwanda. When I look at that journey, I see hope for the continent. And my question to you, Your Excellency, 
is um, what will Africa and Africans need to do over the next uh, two, three or four decades uh, to be able to mirror the kind of uh, growth and transformation that Rwanda has uh, for Africa to earn its uh, place in the global stage. Thank you, sir. Well, uh, thank you for, for your remarks. And um, first, uh, the conversation that you have had here was about um, different uh, growth paths we, 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 we see in Africa or can take uh, in different parts of our continent. And um, so I guess the problems of uh, Africa, Rwanda, and where we have come from, we need one to find, to understand that business should not be as usual. Uh, and we must, because if there are comparisons to make. You look at, you look back in history and then where we were 40 years ago, now we are talking about 40 years ahead, and see where others were at that time that were maybe equivalent in terms of uh, the standing in uh, social economic development. The last part, 40 years, we found those who were like different parts of our continent have moved ahead so many times and, and left our continent, our countries, the continent behind. Or oh, even where we were at that time, we have declined instead of... At, at the same time, like uh, in Joroge again, he has just explained what he's doing, what he's able to do, and. That means we actually can do certain things. We are able to do a number of things that contribute to raising our economies, to uh, the social economic development to a much higher level than where we are now. So maybe we need to be a little bit better organized on our continent and be deliberate and uh, treat what we are doing with a sense of urgency that there is a serious problem we have to address, not just for individuals. Individuals on our continent, many of them solve their problems. They, they are well to do, they've been educated, they do business, they're entrepreneurs, they're innovators. They, you know, they. So at individual levels, we are doing fine. No, but here we are talking about now, well, but that's also a small number. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be exaggerated compared to the rest. If you are talk, looking at the whole population of our continent, which is now getting over 1.2 billion people. Uh, so now the others, let's say the 80% of that population, and then the countries of our continent uh, that should serve our own people. Uh, there has been, of course, in the past, this migration from rural to urban areas, which has both sides. It's a very good side of it. There is uh, also the downside to it in the sense that uh, these migrations, you know, really deliberate or uh, happening on the basis of the movement of talent and the skills and, and so on and so forth. No. Or, or how about those who stay there? At what level do they stay uh, of this social economic uh, standing? So you find there is huge disparity so I, I think the next four years, we should be addressing this problem where Africa really, 
I mean, we, then we see the examples. It needs to, we need to develop. We need to, and different uh, levels of our society need to be part of it and, and, and benefit as well so that the, the development you see in my country is not just uh, the 10% are doing fine, and then the 90%, uh, and then we count the, the wealth of the 10% and say, oh, Rwanda is doing very well. <laughs> no, Rwanda is not doing very well when you have 90 or 80% uh, you know, uh, left with nothing. So this is the problem we have to address. Building on, for example, the contributions that can be made by such uh, companies as Injoragas, uh, fintechs in the financial sector, financial services, and then you can move to any other sector and look at uh, what is there, what I need to do to fill these gaps that remain, uh, that are huge. Uh, between these different levels of our society as far as the uh, social economic indicators are concerned, where Africa really uh, is way behind the rest of the world. So for Rwanda, therefore, and as part of Africa, and the Africa generally, we, ha we have some similarities in terms of opportunities as well as the problems we have before us that we have to manage. So it's organization. It's, uh, the, uh, I'm hesitating to say it's also largely political. The, the politics, the, the political economy of our countries need to be sorted out or looked at differently so that uh, uh, it's about uplifting everybody. It's about actually properly utilizing the resources we have, the immense resources we have. Uh, you know, the analogy that has gone around several times where it's like you have everything in your backyard and then you leave it there, you go begging. <laughs> or, or, or something else, sometimes you, you have everything around in your backyard, somebody comes and helps themselves with it, and then you run after them to say, give me something. Can I have some of it back? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so this is, this is something that Africa needs to change, we, and, and we are capable of doing it. It's the person who asked the question, in Jorage, He's one of those who, and, and so many of them like him, are capable, if the politics, our politics allowed us to scale that up and spread it, and, and everybody, these young people who get educated and come up, you know, have that thinking of saying, no, but uh, it's not just for me. It's for my family, it's for my country, it's for my continent. It's, it's, and we can work together. And so all these uh, things like the African continental free trade area that has been put in place, you know, the story about it. Uh, first of all, we, we thought about it too late already. It should have come 20 years ago. <laughs> 20, 30 years ago. Uh, so same time, what does that mean? It means uh, our own countries are not trading with one another, like other countries uh, in other continents do. So it's like we are just small silos in, on our continent. And so we need to break these barriers deliberately and uh, also uh, we are the treat what we are doing uh, not as business as usual. So it's about, <laughs> so if I can synthesize what I heard you say, you said to really move Africa forward in line with Njoroge's question, it's about 
not doing business as usual. So going back to your the conversation earlier about thinking unconventionally, about um, recognizing what you have in your own backyard and not just waiting for someone to come and find value in your own you know, uh, uh, richness that you have. It's also about um, Pan-African collaboration um, and uh, breaking down barriers like what the African free trade area is trying to do, and also about leadership and, and, and political leadership that ultimately uh, prizes creating opportunity for the, the, the vast majority that do not have, and not simply f enriching the few that already do. So um, that's the blueprint for Africa, people. <laughs> um, OK, so we're now going to take some questions from, from the, 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 the audience in the room. And I'm going to invite uh, Alice to take us to this part. Thank you. Um, so we will now take a few questions from the room. Uh, please remember to introduce yourself your school and followed by a question. Um, please raise your hand high so I can see you. Be clear and concise when you're asking your questions. So we're going to take the first question from this side. Please, go on. Good afternoon again, Your Excellency. My name is Joel Kajirezu, and I'm from the African Leadership University, uh, pursuing international business and trade in my third year. Um, my question goes, um, after the liberation war in 1994, you had to set, have, you had a mindset of saying, let's work together, let's put aside vengeance, and you had to also work with people who were in the government um, of the overseer of the genocide uh, against the Tutsi in 1994. So I wanted to know what was the mindset as one of the person who were affected directly or indirectly by the genocide against the Tutsi in 1994? Yeah. Well, in that case, we had to sort of put aside a little bit our uh, personal grievances that actually rose to the national level because there were so many involved. Yeah, but for a reason, for a reason of reality that there is nothing you could do at that moment or even any other moment to to reverse what happened. You could only manage it and, and try to come out fine in the circumstances, but you couldn't, uh, as a country, we are not going to be able to recover what we lost. We lost people, and there was no way of returning them. So one, you have to think about how to manage that. The second you also have to find a way of managing the future. <laughs> and more importantly, the future. Those who are still alive and those who will be there tomorrow and the country and, and so on and so forth. So where we had to start from was to try and hold the country together. In fact, at one time we had a mixture of, even in the government, as uh, you mentioned, where even in the government, we, there, there were people who also sympathized with the, even the perpetrators of uh, <laughs> that genocide, uh, or, or, or even who were being accused, actually. But we were looking for evidence. Some people were being accused of actually having participated, but they were sitting in a cabinet. So you, you see here, you, you, you try to transcend uh, almost this impossibility of saying how, oh, but this man is a killer, so he's suspected to be a killer. Well, there are signs that you, how do you have him in the cabinet? The answer quietly in one's mind is 
Yeah, you have such a people in the cabinet at that moment so that you can secure the future. <laughs> Uh, you remember one time um, on these commemoration days, uh, a young uh, woman asked me a very touching and maybe complicated uh, question when uh, she asked me publicly and said, uh, President, uh, it's like, why do you keep burdening the survivors with the uh, this weight of reconciliation so that the country moves on. You know, in other words, she was telling me, you know, actually, you, 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 every burden about that is just loaded onto us, which, which I thought was true, which I mean, which, which was true, which is true. So I wasn't really so much prepared for that question in that moment. It's like, why? You are always telling us, forgive, do what, and this. So it's like uh, everything happened to us, but you still come to us and say, please allow us to move on. <laughs> so I, I anyway quickly thought, it almost caught me unawares. And, but I, I quickly learned or remembered something that I had to tell the woman that you know what, uh, we burden you with all this responsibility and the weight of everything because you are the ones who have something to give. Because what I meant was we need sort of reconcile the extremes. Is it the extreme of the victims who, who, who suffered to the extreme? And then there's the side of the perpetrators, the extremity of what they actually did. I said, the only person I can turn to and go to and say, please forgive and ask for forgiveness or to give the other forgiveness is the victim. I can't go to the perpetrator and say, and say what? If, I, if you went to the perpetrator, what do you ask him to do? Just say, oh, don't kill again next time, you know, you see. No, this is not an issue to beg from somebody. Just say, if you were thinking of doing it again, you need to be put in the right place. So, therefore, the burden was ended up being on the side of the victims because they are the ones who had something to offer, to give to society, and that is something very difficult to go beyond your pain and, and provide something that can help address the stability of our country for the future. For the perpetrators, there is little or nothing to, to, to be able to, you can't just go begging them to be better citizens next time, no, that's not. Uh, so, what was on our mind were all these things, the complexities of, uh, of our society, of what happened, and how to get out of it. So, one way was to have these people represented even in the cabinet. <laughs> yes, and say, okay. And then allow time you know, to deliver also on some of the means and the capacities to be able to address uh, the many grievances we couldn't address because we do not have means or, or institutions to take care of that. So that, that's what happened. Mm. Thank you very much. Um, we would like to go to the, at least the other side of the room. Yes, please, at the top. Down there, a little bit. On. They are in the room. <laughs> <laughs> you, 
Excellency, the, the President of the Republic of Rwanda, I'm Ronald Mugabo, a student in level four pursuing law. I'm currently the girl president of University of Rwanda Way Campus and the girl president of University of Rwanda. I'm very thankful to the president's office which gave me this opportunity of meeting my role model of today. So I have a question. Uh, for my sake, I'm going to be specific to my university because uh, there is a problem uh, in, we have. There is a problem of agriculture. Agriculture is contributing all the country's economy. But students from masters, masters from University of Rwanda, College of Agriculture, Animal Sciences, and Veterinary Medicine, programs of crop science, agribusiness, agroforestry, soil management, and animal production. After being enrolled to master's programs, they are facing a problem of lack of tuition fees and living allowance from 2009. As before and some other programs, they are being catered off and they are being given those scholarships and bursaries. So, Your Excellency, we request, it, if it would be possible, you can take part in the in that situation and you see if those students can be facilitated also. The other question we have when countering, there is a problem of these new campuses you're having. There is Thank campus. Thank you very much. Can we just have one question? We okay, can thanks a lot. First. Thank anyway, uh, the, the, the only thing I can promise and say about that is uh, I have no problem uh, working with those responsible to look into the matter and come out with the best uh, thing we can do for, for the well-being of the students or even the faculty or, or, or the university. So uh, on that one, I can promise you, uh, I'm sure those responsible might be here listening. So we, we'll take it forward and see what we can do to address the problem. Thank you very much. We're going to take one last question. Yes, lady at the back, please. Uh, thank you so much, Your Excellency, President Paul Kagame, Dr. Swanika. My name is Martina Abera Kawagambe. I'm currently a third year student at the African Leadership University pursuing global challenges. Uh, so, um, in 1994, after the liberation struggle in Rwanda, a lot of people were scared, those inside the country and outside the country, and they were expecting a lot of chaos and havoc. But that was not the case. This country saw and experienced reconciliation and were given and provided hope for a better tomorrow. Now, currently, in, African, in this African continent, different countries are experiencing coups and chaotic changes or shifts in their leadership or governments. Now, my, president goes, my question goes to you, uh, Your Excellency, President Paul Kagame. I would like to ask you, what is the ingredient for a smooth transition that leads to a positive transformation that is also inclusive? Thank you. Well, you remember, I was going to say 94 to maybe 99, uh, we were really struggling. There was a lot of uh, chaos or confusion, especially 94, 5, 6. Uh, things were not as, as uh, good as they are today. So we had our own share of that uh, uh, situation of chaos and and confusion. Um, so, we, we, the world sometimes, and we keep seeing this everywhere, and we keep saying it, we'll keep, people keep talking about learning lessons, 
this is something that is common everywhere in the world. They say, oh, we learn from lessons, learning lessons. It is the UN, it's the country X, Y, well, you learn lessons. Actually, the world and the countries don't learn lessons. They just end up, <laughs> and you wonder why. Even in our situation, in Rwanda, uh, the world said, you know, Rwanda imploded and, you know, genocide, chaos, and so on, and, the world, and you had the UN here, and you had other people, even countries from outside, but still bad things happened, terrible things happened. They happened at the time they were here, from the beginning, the terrible things, you know, or problems of managing the chaos continued, and the countries were here. And then every time there is that discussion, well, for sometimes uh, academic uh, debate purposes, wherever they say, oh, lessons from here, lessons from Rwanda about this. But these lessons don't serve anyone, it seems, because people just end up. So we learned our lessons. There's no question about it. Uh, maybe enough, uh, maybe not enough, uh, but uh, The, what we learned was to pick our pieces from this tragedy we had in our history, try to mold something out of it, uh, a country that came back to be Rwanda and then move forward. And in doing that, and based on the lessons learned, was to be inclusive, to bring in everybody. This is why earlier we are talking about sometimes bringing even into cabinet people whose backgrounds were questionable. Uh, but doing it deliberately so that you, you give time for hearing or for finding the means to deal with the situations that you are not able to deal with at that moment. And, and also, maybe give an opportunity to this person either to defend themselves or to be better people in the future. So it, it's about doing everything you can to try and you know, bring these pieces together and for the better future. So. Now, about the rest of uh, other parts of our continent. <sighs> if people learned lessons, maybe some of those things could be avoided. I won't have to name names or anything. I, I'll be careful not to do that because I, I don't want to be the problem. The problem is already there, so I don't want to be, <laughs> to be used as an excuse now to be the problem. Uh, but you find what, what leads to some of the coups, maybe not all the coups, but the coups will come out of discontent, political discontent. And in fact, unfortunately, all these things about uh, coups or, or sometimes when, where they have not happened, where you could actually say this situation even it deserves a coup, you see, but it doesn't happen. But it happens among us, the elites, the, the ruling elites, you know, the ordinary people who are the majority, the, the, the ones we serve, the ones we, even that elect us in, to serve in, in office and, and so on. Sometimes they really have no say because for many times there are situations where they have no say. Even when they go for elections, uh, they elect uh, Fred, 
uh, and the winner is Kagame, is, is Paul, not Fred. So somehow, uh, Paul, who has been in power, uh, when it is Fred, he said, no, 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 he uses the means of government to make sure that uh, Fred does not go through. And so Kagame stays on the basis of the political power uh, I have in my hands or the military control I have, you know, and so on and so forth. So, in a way, the, the conflict is like, remains between Fred and Kagame. The ordinary people who were involved to elect their leaders will just uh, go back home and uh, go to their farms and, uh, and wait for another call for elections after four or five years. Or, 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 or. It doesn't matter how many. So, when situations are like this, sometimes people get tired of Kagame manipulating and, uh, you know, there have been so many attempts uh, uh, and, and, and maybe actually Fred might win several times, might stand for in, in different elections like three times winning but the results are in my favor because I have I can still twist them in my favor. Now in between and this is a question all of us can think about and have their say on when you have these so called elections that have gone on and the wrong person winning. Suppose some parts of uh, the country, they say the, 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 the army, which, which, is really should, which really should not even be, which should not be part of the politics, but which I used in my favor because I was the president and uh, involved them in the politics, suppose the part of it actually carried out a coup. We have found ourselves, now the, pro <laughs> the problem here again is sometimes they may not carry out a coup in favor of the person who actually won elections. <laughs> And say, so, you see, we, we, we followed, we knew you, 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 you cheated, you didn't win, it's Fred who, who won. So we take over and give it to Fred. No. They talk over and take it themselves. <laughs> so you, you have three people among the elites who are disgruntled and who are fighting each other. It's me, it's Fred, and it's the army the part of the army. As you see, this really does not involve adequately. The people we, we, we lied to and said they are going to choose their leaders. But this gives, takes me to another point. So in, in, in this case, if the coup happened, we, we have now gone to a point where we ask ourselves, is it a bad coup or is it a good coup? <laughs> Originally, all coups are supposed to be bad, isn't it? Yes. Coup d'etats have no place ordinarily in our society or in our politics. Uh, the army should stay out of politics and should, that's what we know and that's the ideal situation we know. But then we have started having these realities where, you know, in the politics, then comes corruption, then comes nepotism, then comes uh, uh, all kinds of things. Uh, and I'm sorry to say, you, you see it uh, in more than one uh, 
places on our continent. You see where it is just so, oh, so eroding. Oh, then the family, the tribe, the, against others. This is not good politics. This, this can lead to anything. Now, especially corruption. Uh, so this is where now these people are going through to, to cut out coups. And in the end, you get confused when you, you say, oh, in that place there was a coup. Then deep in your heart, you can say, well, I saw it coming. Because you saw what maybe the leaders were doing. But otherwise, leaders supposed to have been elected leaders who should not be touched. But because of these realities on the ground and the things as they developed and maybe the mistakes they made and, and the tribes and the corruption and the, all kinds of things, one or the other happens. And then the rest of the world is, oh, and it's when, when we say, no, 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 this school should not be there. Should not have been there, so everybody out and so on and so forth. Well, the reality is, is increasingly turning out to be different. Sometimes the, the people with the Fred now get an opportunity and say, no, but what are you talking about? Uh, maybe these coup makers are, are okay because, after all, even the one who has been there, you, you are saying the coup has been carried against him, is not the one we erected. We erected Fred. So they will go out on the streets celebrating. Right? So it, 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 it throws everything in turmoil, in chaos. Even people start saying, yeah, but. What are the people saying? The people are saying, yeah, they are happy with this. Even if you say the, the coup makers, making a coup is bad, but they are, they are, they are, there is an argument. People will say, no, but these are bad, but the ones they removed are worse. So <laughs> which way do you go? <laughs> you just go for the bad or for these ones who are worse. So this is what we are, it's a problem that really needs to be looked at critically. Yes? Uh, because if, if I'm going to entrench myself, no matter what people say, if they, I lose and Fred is the winner and I say, no, I am the winner. When you start losing the legitimacy, there's no question about it. And if a coup happened, then people will say, so be it. Of course, you know, we are very polite when it comes to that, or diplomatic, I don't know what to call it. Nobody will really come out and say, uh -huh, this coup was justified. They will always say, no, 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 but you see, you know, what is the African Union saying? What is so-and-so saying? And nobody will say anything. <laughs> so that's where we end. So my friend, the question is, uh, is as loaded as, as you can have it. It's, it's very <laughs> Thank you so much for these questions. Um, I'll now hand over the floor back to Dr. Swanika for the firework. Are, are there people who, I can give you a bonus, a few more questions. Okay. One or two. We can add it. Thank you, Your Excellency. My name is Diana Wamahoro. I'm a student at the University of Rwanda. We can be short to the point and then somebody else yeah, and then thank we... Thank you. 
We cover three instead of one in the same time. <laughs> Thank you. My question is, uh, we have seen our country trying its best to deal with the pandemic, I mean the COVID-19 pandemic, and we have also seen the government doing its part. Then my question is, then what do we need to do as youth? I mean, as young people, we have been hearing saying that we have to be doing big things and also taking care of the small things for yeah. their attention. Then what do we need to do, be it now, be it the Rwandans and the Africans at right, large? Right. Thank you. Right. So yeah, young people, first and foremost, take care of yourselves. That's the number one. As much as you can, uh, like you are putting on the mask and, you know, keep your hands clean, don't go into congested areas. I know you have given up being in the nightclubs or other places. <laughs> so uh, keep, keep trying. Especially for us, we have to even take care of ourselves more than others because while others are vaccinating, we have in most cases been left without vaccination. So those, the vac vaccination, the vaccine has its own protection it gives to people. So that one we have lacked largely. largely. So we use all other methods, we, science tells us, uh, to try and protect ourselves. So please we start with that. The second is, Ourselves really means each other. Don't, don't protect yourself and think it ends there, no. Protect the one next to you as well. That's what putting on the mask means. In, in fact, it's not just uh, uh, protecting yourself, it's also protecting the other one next to you. So once the message is clear, the understanding of what we need to do in this uh, problem, problematic situation of a pandemic like this. There's what you have to do to protect yourself, there's what you, at the same time, protect others, then contribute to, for example, when there are lockdowns, when there are this, when there's working from home. Yes, quickly learn how to work from home, and as productive as if you physically went to or in person to the office or to other place of work. Uh, so there are these limits that are set. We quickly understand them. We quickly understand why they, they are there. And then we conform to that, but trying to do our best to uh, maximize on what we can have in the situation. Uh, so always being proactive and responsive. And, and when uh, this, we, ha we happy to get a vaccine, to vaccinate people, you should be one to go in front of the line and, and be vaccinated if, if the vaccine has not, not uh, well, I'm not going to preach to anyone, but there are people who start having ideas, you know, either conspiracy theories or some, I don't know, say if they put this thing in me and, you know, there's a friend of mine uh, I, I got to know who was not uh, going to be vaccinated. So when I met uh, her, I, I said, why, why, why don't you take a vaccine? Then she told me her thinking, that uh, she has been told by some scientifically aware people that uh, vaccines are actually bad. They leave, so, you know, some bad things in our bodies which may affect us uh, 
I said, even a long time, even if maybe in 30 years and so on, you end up in a bad shape. So, but that person is almost my age. <laughs> so I, I asked her, I said, but if you got the virus, uh, what chance do you have? I said, if you got the virus now and you're not vaccinated, the chances are not uh, plenty. I said, well, if you got vaccinated like me now, you're telling me I have 30 years to worry about the problem. <laughs> I think I'll go for that one. <laughs> I'll go for... <laughs> I, I'll go for the worry of, of the next 30 years than just uh, be knocked out in a week. <laughs> so, uh, so young people you just need to be uh, properly engaged and responsive and uh, taking care of yourselves and contributing to the well-being of the nation and uh, uh, among other things. We'll go to the other side of the room, please. Yes, middle section. But there's one here I saw putting up his hand for, from the beginning, right? You still want to say something or you gave up? <laughs> <laughs> After whoever you asked him and then uh, between the two, you would toss the coin and... Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you, sir, for this opportunity. My name is James Abrahams. I'm a Kenyan from Kigali Independent University. My question is touching on the integration in East Africa, basically, and the promulgation of the African Continental Free Trade Area. As young people here today, we are gathered uh, to get your knowledge on this. And in your experience as the, as the former chair for the East African community, what are some of the areas in which we are not performing to the best of our ability that can help us integrate better and do trade with each other? Basically, yes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Good. You, you, you start from home. Let's say, even here, before you cross the border to anywhere, just make sure that we, as a system, as a country, we are trying to do the best. We are productive. We are working with each other. We are we, we, we are building capacity to compete uh, in the marketplace uh, on anything. Start with that. And second, yes, look for opportunity beyond your borders. Because there is a, a lot more in actual fact. So the, the, the continental free trade area our continent was created so that there can be this free movement of people, of goods, of services, and so on. So broadening not only the market, but of course for the sake of those who are serving or working in it. Uh, so that, that, is, that, that, is, that should be the thinking and everything else will be coming straight to you. Hey, what, what are you doing internally here? What are we doing? What, uh, what are we building? How competitive are we here? Even satisfy our market and then work beyond that market, small market of Rwanda to neighbors. And so I'm sure the same thing is happening with, with others cross borders from the other side of the border. People want to come and do business with you and invest with you. And uh, so back and forth, competition, innovation, delivering on the market what you think you can produce competitive and, and, and sell it there. So that, that's really what we need to be doing. 
And as young people, you need to master this sort of thinking. And don't pity yourself, work hard, put every energy you have into it, and be able to move. You can have the floor, please. Yes. Thank you, Mr. President. My name is Mandir. I am from Djibouti, and I'm a graduating student at the African Leadership University. At the African Leadership University, we are told to dream big, to dream bold, and my question is, um, is Rwanda capable to uh, welcome the World Cup? And if yes, when do you think it might be possible? To welcome what? <laughs> Sorry again. I didn't, yeah? Yes. Is yeah, Rwanda yeah. capable to welcome the World Cup? Yes. If yes, when do you think that might be possible? Thank oh. you. First of all, I, I, I agree with what uh, African Leadership University is teaching. Thinking big and being big. I, I entirely subscribe to that. That is, that for me, the starting point. The second is about the World Cup, right? You see, I'm lucky because there is, there is no threat that I might have it tomorrow. <laughs> because it is already booked for... <laughs> <laughs> the countries are known for, you know, maybe the next 20 years. So I have myself to prepare for the next 20 years, right? So you never know. <laughs> yes, please. yourselves and then we will have you also. Excellency. Thank, Thank you, Your sir. Excellency, for the bonus. Short, short. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Tuise Fabrice. I'm in School of Law at the University of Kigali. Uh, my concern goes to Dr. the CEO of uh, ARU. Uh, sir, you've said that uh, uh, if you want uh, to get an opportunity, please join the loom. And then uh, my concern is that sometimes you find that in that particular room there is a lot of you know person uh, with a different you know position. So uh, it was like, what are some criteria that one may follow, as in to know the light person to go to? Thank you, yes. Sir. Hello? Maybe I answered the idea even some of your questions. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they were coming to you and I assumed they were coming to me. <laughs> I thought you were the guest of honor, but I'll answer your question very quickly. Um, you know, my advice to you when you're in a room with people who have opportunities is uh, to take the time to build relationships with them. Um, you know, one of the, I, I talk that I described that there are four steps to building a relationship, right? So when you meet someone for the first time, you have a, a, a connection with them. Maybe there's some chemistry, you have something in common, you exchange some ideas, they give you their card, you give their phone number, that's the first step. Then the second step, you get to continuous interaction. You exchange emails, you meet up for lunch, you take WhatsApp messages, you, you, you spend time together. And through that continuous interaction, the person gets to see whether you are someone who's a doer or just a talker. And they get to understand, your, are you a person with integrity or not? Are you someone who has the skills you're saying you have? And then they start to really form trust with you, which is the third stage. 
And then only when you have trust, you get to fourth stage, which is collaboration. That's when you now can do something together. You get a job, you get venture capital for your business, you get funding for your nonprofit, whatever it is. So the mistake I see so many young people making is they meet someone today and then they expect something from them tomorrow. And you haven't done the work to show that you are someone, like the president was saying earlier, that you also uh, you are using the little that you have to, to get ahead, to do the best you can, and that you're someone that can be trusted and then that they can invest in you. So that's my advice for you, is take time to build relationships just for relationships sake. Don't just be going and getting things from people. The final thing I'll say is, um, you, you, know, you need to think about relationship building like a bank account. You can't just withdraw from it and take, take, take. You also need to give, especially if you're a leader. Your role as a leader is not just to get stuff, it's to give and to create opportunities for others. So just as you are in the room and you're getting opportunities, you must be creating opportunities for other people. And if you do that, then you'll find that you'll succeed. Thank you very much. So our last question. Quickly here, we finish and take one from there. If they have sorted themselves out and then we let's see. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, my name is Benin Isawane, representing Davis College at Aquila. Uh, well, Mr. President, uh, as someone who has always been the key person behind the Rwandan development, uh, I would like to hear from you, what is the one key thing that guides you and makes you capable of doing uh, all the things you do in such a unique way as you do? Thank you, sir. Well, I'm not sure what... I thought you were going to tell us about yourself, but uh, I, I, for lack of better ways of putting it, uh, I find, first of all, there is something maybe I'm not really very responsible for, nature. Nature, you know, shapes you the way it wants sometimes, maybe your genes or something. So there are things. Then there is also the nurture, the environment. So between, for every human being, by the way, I'm, I'm not talking about myself. So the environment shapes you, combines with the nature, the person. Then, so in the in the environment, you learn things. You are attracted to some. You reject others. You want to do things. You have you develop uh, interests in. So because of what you've been exposed to and so on. So, dear, if for me, what I've done uh, or contributed to for this country and with others comes from sort of that background. So the, 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 the environment uh, I, I grew up in and then uh, probably part of me that I, I, I'm not very, I can't say uh, I determined uh, on that. It's like I did not determine what my height is or what my big size is. So I can sometimes you, these are things that happen to you and you are not responsible, really. You cannot. But then once you are there with that, and then, so for me, thrust into the world of Rwanda and then politics and the history of Rwanda, so I have benefited one way or the other. Uh, from this compression of nature and nature. So that's, that's how I happen to be doing things the way I do. And then quickly, and then we go up, and maybe we need to wind down. Uh. Up one from here, then. Um, thank you, His Excellency. Um, Junius Bonu from Carnegie Mellon University, Africa. Um, I wanted you to tell us, we've seen what have been done by you and your team 
regarding digital transformation of Rwanda. A lot of countries are still trying, and I want you to tell us the, the key ingredient of such a successful digital transformation, and if you were to give an advice to um, an aspiring African future tech leader, what would it be? <laughs> I, wish, uh, I wish you had asked the person next to you. She's, uh, she's responsible for things uh, digital. <laughs> But I think it's like um, many other things. One, it is about people. You have people, you have young people who, uh, and then as I said earlier, most things are driven by our political thinking as well. Uh, but you have the people, you have the thinking, the, and then the rest is to put to be organized and put the tools in place, which are in the end a part of the investments you make in the people, in people, infrastructure. And then when these things have happened, they start producing what encourages other people to, where it is, if you see how uh, digital technology drives businesses, drives uh, services, or as we said, even during the pandemic, you see, I think to a decent extent we, we, we did fine because the thinking, the infrastructure, the people, the tools were already in place. So once people said, oh, no going back to place of work, nothing, you know, you need to work from home. It's like people woke up and say, oh, actually it is possible because we already have this. We're only going to do it in the office, but you could do it from here using these tools we have. And so it's uh, the investments never go wrong once you have invested in the people, in the policy, uh, in infrastructure, uh, and then uh, the politics of it will drive it. But more so, uh, it will be accelerated by what you see is already the outcome, what, what starts happening that you find is beneficial. Advice? Advice for an aspiring technology leader. He, wa of, uh, he wants to be a, a technology leader in Africa, and he's uh, asking, what advice would you give for someone like him? Oh, it is, you grasp those ideas and uh, <laughs> find your place in, in, in the middle of that. <laughs> OK. You have time but, uh, but for any more advice, please, uh, you knew her? All along she was sitting next to you and you didn't, she's the minister of IT and plus, plus, plus. And <laughs> <laughs> Should we have okay. the last question? Hello? Up there, up there, we, say, we agreed up there. Morning. Uh, my name is Daniela Ngarambe. I'm a master's student in electrical and computer engineering at CMU Africa. And my question is, despite being the lowest emitting continent in the world, Hello, Africa... What? Despite? Despite Dis being the lowest emitting continent, emitting continent in the world. Lowest emitting continent. Okay, right, right. Africa is facing a lot of repercussions in terms of climate change. And my question was, how can the youth contribute to slowing down climate change in Africa and improve intercontinental relationships to fast track this agenda. Thank you. I, I need to write a book for the answer. It's, 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 it would be a long answer, but, <laughs> uh, but I, I think um, I understand what you are saying. Um, the Africa being uh, more at the receiving end, really, of the climate uh, crisis, and yet uh, 
not contributing as much as uh, so what we need to do is to start early ourselves not to solve the problem so you we have to leapfrog not to start solving the problem by going the route of those others who are meeting and are trying to reverse and then trying to reverse that ourselves in the wrong run. So we have to leapfrog. It is adoption of these technologies that uh, uh, are green in their nature and uh, also uh, trying to think hard about the, the very policies that can because like now we are, we are developing in many ways, we are starting from a low base. If we start adoption of these technologies, for example, and uh, uh, developing that way, we, we have a chance, first of all, of uh, uh, managing our situation the way it should be ourselves, but also use that as a basis uh, for the others now who even are polluting the world more than ourselves and making certain demands uh, so that maybe in the future people start paying for their level of, of, of polluting uh, our environment. Uh, so you will be on the good side of that from there. But this requires a concerted effort requires all of us to understand, and it doesn't matter which field you are in. It's about the thinking, so that you contribute to the future well-being. So somebody is there, and then we, I told you to choose one, but I can still see five. Uh, sorry, moderator, I took over your... <laughs> yes, you can have... So you and the one behind you. One uh, in the, in the uh, thank you, Mr. light blue President. shirt or something. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'm Mohammed Umar. Uh, I'm from Sudan. I study AI at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, my question is, you have made, it, you have made a strong point on uh, addressing the African context and uh, grassroots solutions, uh, but I also recognize that this is a very um, common political talking point for many African leaders. I would like you to tell us from your long what? experience. Uh, Fred, Fred, is it addressing what? The, the African context. The African context. Yes. Okay. All right. But right. yeah, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a common political course, point uh, for many African leaders. Yeah. And from your long experience, and because I truly believe that, uh, you are the only person I can trust <laughs> to actually answer me uh, transparently about that. What do you think is the African context? Because, of course, it's not just development. The Global South has very similar social illnesses and economic illnesses to Africa. What makes Africa unique? Is it just a political talking point uh, to pass on things like, um, you know, native, uh, native and local polit uh, policies? without being bothered, and how can we use this knowledge of really addressing and knowing what exactly um, you mean by the African context in developing and creating truly African, truly strong, truly effective uh, institutions, uh, technological frameworks, and uh, solutions to build the Africa of tomorrow. Thank you. Is it the African context, if you will, really means the African story, because Africa was not born yesterday. Africa has been there for a long time. And then we have seen how things have evolved over many years. Uh, so in that African story and the context, if you will, there is the African itself context. 
and how it interacts with external factors or actors. So th these have come together. Okay. So what I mean, therefore, when I'm okay. talking about the, 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 the African context myself or the way I understand it, is these two things as mashed together. And so from the perspective of the African, what do you want? You may not say, no, I'm going to be the African uh, of uh, 18th century or 17th. That's the, the, the original, the, the real African. No, the, 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 that evolution and the interaction between the, the African story and the externalities that affected it have formed a completely different context or evolution where we find ourselves. And in that, there are things we have to accept and others we have to reject. Uh, one simple thing, the, the mentality of it. Uh, if there is any notion that the African story has to be shaped from outside, it's what the outside tells us to do that you do, uh, I will say, no, that's not uh, correct. I will say, at least the minimum, we should talk about it. You see, you give me a chance to interact with you on what you think is good for me. That is the minimum. Uh, and that is different from saying, no, don't talk to me, don't say anything to me. Leave me alone to my African context as, as I explain it, as I think it is. Because we, in the end, we don't think about that the same way, even as Africans. So there has got always to be that back and forth. It's like, no, give me a moment. If you are from outside and you say, no, 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 you should be doing this, you do this. I say, no, no, but this is Africa. You are from somewhere else. And I know, I'm conscious that the African story is this meeting point of the Africa itself as it has always been and uh, has been evolving, but also with the interaction with the rest of the world because there is not going to be that without that interaction. So now, that, that is for me the African context I'm talking about. And we should be able to explain it. You see, um, I think that point was, is very good, in, but very broad in a sense. You see, it's like uh, in, in a country. You find a country in Africa, X, or let's even call it Rwanda. Uh, the politics might be wrong or go wrong. It's not serving really the interests of the people of Rwanda. Or the leaders may be the wrong leaders uh, who even do harm to their own people, the people they are supposed to lead, uh, including sometimes killing people, your own people. There is no such a situation that is going to justify that you are going to do these wrong things and the people should keep quiet because this is your country, this is your Africa, this is your country. No. <laughs> the, the, the African or the continent or the country or the African country also has certain standards, has certain values, has certain minimum. You see, it's like uh, even in our own country in 94, when the genocide was taking, was happening. Actually, there were all kinds of uh, arguments across the world, including at the UN. By the way, that when it happened at the UN, Rwanda was holding a non-permanent seat 
at the UN Security Council. So, and, and this, the, the ambassador who was there at the time, really was arguing, it was like telling people off. It's, it's like, uh, what we are doing in Rwanda is our business. You see what I mean? So it's like, no, this is uh, the African, this is the Rwandan story, leave us alone. No, there is no, living, when it crosses a certain line, it is no longer just Rwandan. It's, it has become uh, internationalized. It's to be looked at in the very wide context of, of the world standards and what is expected of you. Uh, so we have to be careful so that indeed people don't abuse the African context. The African context, if properly defined and described, has nothing wrong with it. If you take care of all of these needs and, and parameters that have to be uh, driving our, our, our politics and our development and, and, and that context. So to the African Union, therefore, African Union is a structure that is in place that brings together Africa through which we can bring these ideas or grievances or you know, any misunderstandings and we, or, or different ideas we don't agree on and try and narrow the gaps that are there and, and see if we can make a... So that's why people sometimes are in or out and saying this or that, saying that, or when it come, happens to a problem and say, oh, African Union needs to intervene, some people, the Africans themselves may be uncomfortable and say, oh, you know, I don't, because then you, you realize there is something wrong because why would you be afraid of the African institution getting involved? Uh, it, it's that trying to run away from, you know, being able to come up front and explain what you are doing and say there is nothing wrong. So in other words, you are, you are just fearing accountability or being held accountable, and that's why you are avoiding it. Otherwise, and, and if anything, if the institution of the African Union was going to do something and there's something wrong, there are also ways of checking it and saying, no, no, no. These structures that, supposed to, that is supposed to be serving all of us is not actually serving all of us, is, has gone astray. Then there is somebody to come up and say, no, 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 we can check that excess if, if there is. But there can be excess with the country or with the institution. So, but voices should come up and say what they want to say uh, about uh, correcting something. But the African context is there and exists and should be actually strengthened. But wearing, bearing in mind of, uh, you know, this interaction with, uh, on the final point on that, you see, I really, find it problematic in that interaction that something, somebody believes they have the right and the power and everything to say something about you and even be consequential about that and when you cannot say anything about them, <laughs> you see that, that, that is, I would not mind if you would come to me and say, you know, this is wrong, please, you know, you must change. I say, okay, then I look at it. But you should accept that at one time, if you are doing anything wrong, I should be able to point out and say, hey, please, what is wrong? <laughs> yes. Otherwise, we, we, have, uh, we would have such a bad imbalance where, you know, it's like, uh, Everyone right here, east, west, north, east, uh, uh, south, north, south. 
I, heard, I always hear people talking about God, right? Uh, and when they are talking about God, it's like God is God for all of us, right? I don't think God would have made one part of the world more important than the other part. <laughs> Yeah, somebody behind you, and maybe we end there. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'm Khalil, uh, a Tunisian student in Carnegie in Africa, focusing on IT entrepreneurship. So I totally get, uh, I, I'm, I, I'm totally amazed by how Rwanda is now trying to be a business hub. So one of the questions that I want to ask is how today Rwanda is trying to support their, to build startups here and also to expand them. And uh, meanwhile, also how to support African startups to also come to Rwanda. And by support, is, it's, it includes programs, uh, tax reduction, uh, financial support, and everything. Thank you. Yeah, but uh, you have said it all. You have actually answered the question. <laughs> That's exactly what you want to do. The timeline. Sorry? The timeline. Oh, time because line. I saw Startup Act, which have been already a working project, but I guess it got postponed thanks to COVID. Yeah, timeline it shouldn't go beyond the next three years, actually. Okay. But if we can do it in one year or less, that's what we will do. Perfect. Right? So it is, it is a journey we are walking, knowing that many things we don't have in place. Uh, but we are trying to put in place as quickly as we can, but I should say I would be more comfortable from now going forward. We should see a lot of progress and there should be no questions in the next uh, or beyond uh, two, three years. Great. Well, thank you so much for all those uh, questions from the floor. And thank you, Mr. President, for your generosity in giving us this extra time and uh, for giving the bonus questions to, um, to our audience. Um, we're about to wrap up now. Um, and um, to wrap up, Mr. President, uh, we'll just take five minutes. Um, and um, we're going to do something that I call, that, that's it's my favorite thing to do on this pathway called the firewalk. So for this part uh, of the conversation, Mr. President, I'm going to ask you a series of questions uh, in a rapid fire uh, mm. session. I, 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 rapid fire is something I experienced uh, <laughs> more than... Uh, <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you to respond to these questions in seven words or less. The first question is, name one thing many people don't know about you. Just one thing. Everything is known about me. Oh. <laughs> Describe your presidency in three words. Opportunity to serve. Wow, brilliant. <laughs> Opportunity to serve, that is perfect. I wish more African presidents would, would see their jobs that way. <laughs> Finish this sentence. Rwanda is. You are home. You are home. All right. Thank you. <laughs> what is one thing you, you have learned from being a grandfather? Age. Age. <laughs> okay. Name one item you could never live without. Information. Information, ah. What did you want to be when you were a little boy? A pilot. I want to fly planes. A pilot, okay. Mm -hmm. Where do you go to think? Anywhere. Anywhere, always thinking. Arsenal or Paris Saint-Germain? Both. <laughs> Education or leadership? 
two sides of the same coin. Ah, okay. What makes you smile? Family. Family, beautiful. <laughs> Best basketball player of all time? Steph Curry. Stephen Curry, all right. What three words would First Lady Mrs. Kagame use to describe you? You better ask her. <laughs> okay. All right, so the final question, Your Excellency, of this whole interview, what are your parting words to our audience, to everyone who's in the room, to the young people in the room, to the room members listening uh, online and Zoom, and to everyone watching on YouTube? What are your final parting words for everyone that has joined us today? Young people, you have uh, opportunity. Just take it and run with it. Great.